body intact or not. Who knows? From there, I'm going to try to cover a broad range of perspectives that many of Ohio's citizens might share of deer. And in particular, we'll break different stakeholders and constituency groups into primarily caring about managing deer or primarily caring about managing for deer. And then eventually we'll settle in and uh, focus on a solid framework for understanding sort of the role of deer as we manage woodland habitat and the rest of the landscape, scape, at least as I see it. So why is Gabe Carnes here talking to you about deer? <clears throat> well, this snotty nosed little kid in 1996 passed his hunter safety course and killed his first deer with my dad by my side in 1996 on grandma and grandpa's farm in Northwestern Pennsylvania. And if you're familiar with the Pennsylvania deer story, this was at the height of their population deer explosion. Um, fact, not fiction, uh, we counted over 60 deer from the stand that day. And I took a shot and connected with the only deer that we saw and confirmed had a legal set of antlers. And as you can see from the picture, it was a gigantic buck because the antlers are so, oh, wait a second. You can hardly even tell that it's a buck, right? So not saying we saw 60 individual deer or am ruling out the possibility that other legal bucks were seen, but not recognized. Just saying this is where my experience and hopefully some credibility begins. Fast forward eight years, 2004, I go back to grandma's farm and the deer population had been curbed substantially. Um, that day there were four of us in the woods. I took a doe. Um, my cousin-in-law, I guess that's a thing, uh, he took this buck. The following day my dad took a doe. Um, between the four hunters, we took three deer in two days and saw about 20 total. Um, but my Pennsylvania relatives had this to say about the season. It was all right. I mean, we, we got a couple, but Nothing like the good old days. Just a few years later, had I returned, a good number seen in a day would be four or five deer. And those same relatives today view the Pennsylvania Game Commission with a great deal of contempt um, for ruining those, and I quote, good old days. Um, funny thing is those same aunts and uncles and cousins don't complain when they can raise a garden without an eight foot tall fence. When a buck is taken, it tends to be pretty darn nice and venison's on the table and the freezer's still in steady supply. So back to me for a second. If you know me at all, you know that my passion for chasing whitetails and other game in the woods and on the mountain has not waned. I see the chat box blowing up. All right, good deal. Just making sure that wasn't like, hey, we can't hear you. All right. Um, <clears throat> yeah, it, that has not waned. So know that at some point, I will likely levy some fairly heavy critiques against deer hunters at a, as a constituency. I am criticizing that tribe from within the village. All right, so know that about, about me. Now, I don't want you to think that I'm throwing my extended family under the bus as some small radical group of nut jobs that love conspiracy theories. Um, misinformation and conspiracy theories actually abound. Um, this undermining of state agency wildlife management has actually culminated in a formal audit of Pennsylvania's deer management system. Uh, Gary Alt, pictured here, fled the state, literally fearing for his life under multiple death threats. Uh, and you can kind of see some of the um, internet propaganda. Um, is the Game Commission stalking wolves to facilitate extermination? Are they in bed with all the insurance agencies? Um, yeah, we got the audit to be conducted, but was it just a big con too? It gets crazier. Now, back before we had a sound understanding of wildlife science in 2018, what 
Okay, so what I'm about to share with you is 2018. It is new, it is fresh, it is not antiquated and outdated. From the Pen Friends of Pennsylvania Wildlife, House Bill 1483. Friends of Pennsylvania Wildlife, and this is all quote from their webpage, represents the interests of millions of wildlife loving citizens of the Commonwealth. Notice also that I'm picking on Pennsylvania, not Ohio right now, okay? Including sportsmen, campers, camp owners, hikers, mountain bikers, bird watchers, wildlife photographers, and any who are concerned about the future of our wildlife resources. Today, the populations of many species of forest dwelling wildlife are rapidly declining and desperately need our help. Numbers of rough grouse, our state bird, are now at a 50 year low. Other game and non-game animals from snowshoe hares and wild turkeys to many songbirds, bats, and even pollinators such as bumblebees and monarch butterflies are spiraling downward. I, I kind of like this message. Please join with 600,000 of your fellow citizens who are now friends of Pennsylvania wildlife towards resolving this current conservation crisis. Uh, I'm, I'm, about, I'm ready to sign up. Pennsylvania has always been recognized for the vastness of its hardwood forests and abundance of wildlife. Today, however, many of Pennsylvania's forest dwelling wildlife species are facing crises because of deteriorating forests. Old age forests, averaging 80 to 120 years old, are choking out the sunlight from reaching the forest floor and, and therefore preventing the growth of understory vegetation as vital food and cover for wildlife. Here's where it gets interesting. Again, this is a House bill in the General Assembly of Pennsylvania, okay? In 2018, the Pennsylvania Game Commission has failed to recognize this circumstance and instead blamed the lack of understory vegetation solely on overbrowsing by deer. From 2000 to 2004, the commission initiated an assault on the statewide deer herd, our state mammal, slaughtering over 2.5 million deer. From 2005 to the present, they have maintained the assault leaving only one to two deer per square mile in some regions of the state. Now, if you click around a little bit more on the website, you'll find another article called the Chips Chesapeake Farms Connection. And I quote, the PGC lists four staff biologists within the agency's deer and elk section, one elk biologist and three deer biologists. It can be no coincidence that of the myriad of accredited university degree programs throughout the nation, which annually produce thousands of professional wildlife and conservation biologists, that all three deer biologists employed attained their graduate degrees from the same college, North Carolina State University, were mentored by the same advisory team, and conducted their thesis deer research along the eastern shore of Maryland at Chesapeake Farms. Whereas students from most university wildlife degree programs are educated and trained to view deer as an asset to the natural ecosystem and society, PGC's three deer biologists were trained in a setting that views deer as a negative impact causing, oh, a negative impact causing element with little to no emphasis placed on the positive values of deer. This can be no mere coincidence and is a great matter of concern. It is therefore evident that Pennsylvania Game Commission's deer biologists were not hired to manage Pennsylvania's deer herd in the best interest of the resource or sportsman, or to pursue the commission's mission statement as prescribed by state law. Instead, it appears that they were hired to decimate the herd in this they have achieved. Whew. <clears throat> Thank goodness for the internet. Thank goodness for good information. Um, I better find out where that Chesapeake Farms place is and steer wide and clear of there. A um, little harder to avoid NC State because I grew up in the Piedmont of North Carolina, but plenty of other schools to attend, Duke, Wake Forest, East Carolina. I could even be a Tar Heel. Um, so <clears throat> continuing on here. In a long and winding path, I spent two years in master's and another four years plus in PhD before I came here to Ohio State. Um, looking at things like adult buck behavior in relationship to hunting pressure. Reproductive performance of does, factoring in things like the does age and the does weight. Um, the phenomenon of spike on one side bucks, um, frequently accused as being sort of a genetic um, abnormality and 
treating spike on one side bucks as sort of a, a obligatory duty to remove them uh, from the herd in order to preserve um, intact and healthy gene pool, sort of disbanding that myth. Um, looked at age specific strategies, that is how does a young buck versus an old buck move during the breeding season in order to maximize breeding opportunities. Newsflash, they're not the same. Um, this is kind of appropriate for Halloween, a bone eating bacteria <laughs> that was hyper prevalent uh, at one of my study sites eats down through the skull and results in a mortality causing brain abscess. Pretty gnarly and gross stuff. Um, and then this long and winding path I end up here in Ohio um, helping the Division of Wildlife retool um, their spatial framework for managing the deer herd and crafting some deer management units uh, based on socio-ecological factors. Um, and even though this isn't uh, front and center in outward facing regulations now, and I would put in parentheses yet, um, this is sort of the backdrop by which our state's deer biologists uh, seek to understand um, phenomena within, within our state's uh, deer herd. Oh, hmm. I forgot to mention one little thing. <clears throat> I did my master's research at Chesapeake Farms. <laughs> Man, I wish I was in person because I, I hope at least one of you would giggle at this point. Um, so that's why I'm in a nutshell here speaking about deer. Um, whether again, my credibility is now intact or not, I really don't know. And I guess because I'm gonna continue speaking one way or another, don't care. All right, so are we talking about managing deer today or are we talking about managing for deer? Uh, my answer, yes. The majority of society would say that they are principally concerned with managing deer without the preposition inserted there. Um, but some small segment of society is still interested in managing for deer. Let's take a deeper dive and see what this might look like depending on who you are. So as we run through these scenarios, internalize the different sentiments and in a nutshell, sum up your attitude towards deer. For some of you, I imagine it's very simple and not nuanced at all. Uh, but for most of us, likely our attitudes towards this iconic North American ungulate um, is nuanced, it's complex. It depends on the circumstance. It might even change through time. Clintonville resident. I like seeing them, but sure wish they'd stay away from my landscaping. And I always know when they pass through at night. Those neighbors' dogs. Pickerington resident. So, Suburban suburb to Columbus. I cannot believe how many deer you can see in an evening's walk around the Pickerington Ponds Metro Park. It can be like a zoo. In growing a garden without a legit fence, forget about it. US 33 daily commuter. You know, it depends on the time of year, but I, I do leave an hour early during November to get home. Um, if I don't, there's a good chance that my car will be wearing another deer as a hood, hood ornament, applying that this has happened before. Um, that said, dodging them isn't as bad as it once was. Uh, somebody said the new bypass uh, is helping keep the deer in the woods and off the road. Farmer in Adams County. So if you're not familiar with where Adams County is, picture Cincinnati. Picture the Ohio River, and then picture Southeast Ohio with its mature, dense forests. Adams County is right there in between. Well, they're thick. Not as thick as they were 10 years ago, but boy, some of my smaller fields, they still get hammered. 
don't have much they cut into my bottom line, but it's not just a little. Farmer in Seneca County. This is Northwestern Ohio. I'm sure they caused some issues, but your numbers are good right now. I, we're not having the damage we had 10 years ago, and my kid can still find a buck to shoot every November for the freezer if he, if he hunts just a few days. Ah, bringing it home. Woodland owner from Muskingum County, so out the 70 corridor towards Pennsylvania, about halfway. Historically, one of the highest deer density counties in the state. I'd see 20 to 30 a night 10 years ago, but they aren't quite as numerous anymore. I, I think they're rebounding though. Funny thing is, my woods are still recovering from those couple decades when there were deer everywhere. I, I could go on, right? I could come up with a quote that embodies that of a Metro Parks manager. Well, we got a lot of deer and they're eating us out of house and home, but every time I come up with a decent idea to try to manage numbers, the public is up in arms about not wanting, right? Or human medicine, linkages with Lyme's disease. If you're a certified tree farm owner or a Christmas tree grower, <laughs> you're concerned. If you're a volunteer naturalist and you're really keenly in tune with those rare sensitive forb species in the forest, you may be keenly aware of deer through their impacts through our bivvery. If you're a mayor or a council member, it's entirely likely that at some point you have citizens, likely disgruntled, coming to you about the local deer. If you're an insurance claims adjuster, if you're a forest or wildlife ecologist, I even threw Tonk and Clint up there because they're our state's deer program coordinator and deer biologist. They manage deer. They would be the first to tell you that they do not often manage for deer. Much of their job is tempering expectations between these different constituencies and stakeholders to provide a balanced, sustainable number of deer on Ohio's landscape. Easier said than done. Hopefully at this point, you would agree with me that society has a deer problem. <laughs> You know, we could take a minute or two to highlight some of the ways that deer are conservation wrecking balls, but I would go one step further and say that because conservation is embedded within society, conservation also has a deer problem at certain times to greater or lesser extents, but we have a deer problem. Now, <clears throat> brings me to, uh, oh, when you're a kid, when I was a kid, I get grounded. I was not a always obedient child. You get grounded. And my dad would look at me and say words that were utterly baffling at the time. Now as a parent, I understand what he was trying to communicate, but he'd say something to this effect. Son, I'm only grounding you for a month because I love you and because it's good for you. And I'm like, what? Dad, you are making no sense right now. This sucks right? But if you consider deer and put them in the role of that kid, we're managing your population for your sake, right? Deer are keystone species, it could be argued. Deer are ecosystem engineers, it could be argued. And I would say like the preponderance of evidence suggests that they do play a role as a keystone species and ecosystem engineer. And they have a termite tendency, Deer are one of the only species around that can literally eat themselves out of house and home. Again, pulling together a wide body of evidence and me suggesting, I think many of us would agree, conservation has this deer problem. Now, we focused an awful lot on managing for deer, or managing deer. Now, managing for deer. Who is managing for deer? Well, many deer hunters, not all, many deer hunters have it in their mind that the way in which they operate on their land, in essence, is managing for deer. Now, is there anything wrong with that? Hopefully by the end, you'll see that 
if the approach is balanced, then the answer is no. I will throw in one other group here, deer watching enthusiasts. And, and these are not folks that when they see a deer say, hey, that was neat. All right. These are folks that have year round bait piles designed to attract deer so that they can watch them and their zeal would equal that of the most avid of backyard bird feeder bird watchers. Okay. Um, so there are a few stakeholders that a general characterization would be that they want to manage for deer. Now, uh, this sort of brings us to the end of the different stakeholders, different constituencies. So, you know, like process that, kind of chew on it for a couple seconds. Where do you land? Do you, do you share sentiments across the aisle? Do you have a bipartisan relationship <laughs> with deer? Do you acknowledge the need to manage deer, but also, I'm a hunter, I kind of want to manage for deer a little bit too. Or, or are you a hunter and have a hard time with the fact that, man, it seems like everybody's pushing against this species that I really love, right? I, I would argue that we must needs adopt a bipartisan view of deer, all right? So can the two play nice together? Yes, they can. Um, and the four cornerstones of QDM, QDM, which stands for Quality Deer Management, for which there is an organization, a very large membered organization. Um, <clears throat> their four cornerstones really sum up why these two statements can play nice together. In order, okay, so order matters here. Herd management followed by habitat management. Often the herd is managed by managing our hunters. And then that fourth bullet I think is important because it allows us to learn through time as a deer population fluctuates and understand its impact on the habitat that they call home. So herd monitoring is another cornerstone of this quality deer management philosophy, if, if you will. Um, <clears throat> from the organization's mission statement, I just sort of like pulled this quote, but I assure you that I'm presenting it in a way that is contextually appropriate. To promote sustainable, high quality deer populations. Keyword here is quality. And unfortunately, as much as I want to give my tribe, deer hunters, collectively the pass, um, I don't know that they deserve it. Trust me, I still go to Pennsylvania every year to enjoy a Thanksgiving turkey. My aunts, uncles, cousins, still complaining about the fact that the quantity isn't what it used to be and failing to recognize that the deer that are left are much higher quality and they are not alone in that sentiment. House Bill 1483, 600,000 strong. So <clears throat> quality or quantity? Uh, I think personally one of the finest reports to come out of the deer program in Ohio in the last 10 years um, was one literally titled quality versus quantity. So let's take a deeper quick dive into this aspect of quality and parse what exactly we mean by that, all right? So um, deer populations have built-in dipsticks. Um, so not the derogatory, you're a dummy, you're a dipstick. No, this is like the, is my vehicle functioning properly and have enough oil to keep all the parts lubricated so that I don't break down on my way to work tomorrow, right? So uh, what are those built-in diagnostic dipsticks? Well, it turns out for a deer population, one is the habitat. So you can get a read on the condition of a deer population by getting a read on cues within the habitat. But what we'll focus on here is that the individual deer themselves possess built-in dipsticks that index the population. That is 
herd condition at the population level. Doe fawn reproduction, yearling buck antlers, and trophy buck records. We'll focus on the first two today. So that first one, doe fawn pregnancy rates. Um, it will likely surprise many of you <clears throat> that a fawn that enters this world and is dropped by her mother in May or early June, when conditions are on a high nutritional plane, that fawn that is one day old on June 1 can ovulate and successfully be bred and carry a litter that very same fall. As a five or six month old deer, ovulate, be successfully bred. It's pretty remarkable, okay? Herself then, by default, 12 to 14 months old, she is dropping fawns, usually a singleton. Um, but it's pretty remarkable that when conditions are flush with resources, that that's even possible. Now, ODNR has for decades collected from deer vehicle collisions in the spring reproductive tracts of female deer. And you can go inside that reproductive tract, you can back age the fetus by how long they are. Uh, but you can also learn simply, was that deer carrying? And if so, one, two, or three. And were they all buck fawns? Were they all doe fawns? Or were they some mix thereof? Now, interestingly enough, and perhaps not that surprising, in Ohio's farmland, again, I should have pointed out, farmland in the white, hill country, the heavily forest portion of Ohio in the gray, Farmland, those deer are living on a higher nutritional plane. Um, as someone who likes to eat venison, I love to eat corn country venison. Depending on the year, they can even have a little bit of intermuscular marbling, like you'd see in a really nice prime grade ribeye at the grocery store. Okay. Remarkably, over 60% of fawns were carrying a fawn themselves almost 40 years ago. But you can see that nosedive. In the more heavily forested portion of Ohio, lower rates, but still half. But again, you can see that decline through time over about a 30 year time step. Now, when we overlay the average of those two, so this is Ohio in general, with our population growth trend, you can see that fawn pregnancy rate may be related to deer density, as indexed by buck harvest, which is a very reliable way to index our statewide deer herd numbers. So dipstick number one, fawn rate of pregnancy declines as population density increases. Dipstick number two, the diameter of a yearling box antler. Now this is recognized across studies and across regions, the gold standard for tracking trends in deer herd condition. And, and the reason is this, <clears throat> as a male deer with your first set of antlers, your chief responsibility to yourself is to achieve optimal body growth and body maintenance. And then with whatever's left over, if anything even is, you invest the remaining sort of skimming the gravy off the top resources into antler growth. Once all those other more important priorities have been taken care of. So, Antler bean diameter is measuring sort of the surplus over and above and beyond minimal nutritional plane in the landscape. Okay, and that's dictated by habitat quality. Break this into three slides here. Um, Northwestern Ohio, <clears throat> Hancock and Williams County, you can see those flagged on the map with the stars. Even though the rate of fawn pregnancies declined 
in that farmland region over the last 30 years. Um, you can see here over the last 40 years that yearling antler beam diameter has not budged. It's a flat line, 25 millimeters, average diameter of a yearling's antler beam diameter at the base. Shifting towards the forest ag mosaic portion of our state, you can see that when deer numbers were low back in the 70s, these counties achieved near similar measurements. Right? So the, the dipstick on herd condition looked nearly identical. But the difference here is that through time, that diagnostic has declined. Now, not precipitously. What is the difference in two or three millimeters, right? It's minute. In southeastern Ohio, this is the heavily forested portion of our state, of course, starting two millimeters lower. So a completely different starting baseline, a slightly more precipitous decline. And if you think about a antler that's 19 millimeters as compared to 25, we're talking about a nutritional plane that may be in the 20 to 30 percent difference range. But who cares? Well, deer hunters do, right? I think we all should care because as stewards of natural resources, the desire should be to manage a resource in a way that is sustainable for the resource itself. And maintains intact that natural resources, health and integrity. So for deer, one of nature's ultimate generalists, a decline in five or six millimeters of antler beam diameter. If we think beyond deer, what is this saying about other wildlife that are more specialists in nature? What is the story of those species? Well, I'll let you insert the example that you want, and we'll get there in a bit, but the story is a great deal more ugly, okay? The, the story of rough grouse is more complicated than just changes in habitat, but certainly their story does reflect in part, to a much more severe extent, this small decline in how big around a yearling buck's antler diameter is. All right. Moving beyond this discussion of quality and quantity, um, but there is one more small thing here. <clears throat> right or wrong, and I don't wanna go down the rabbit hole of why state agency funding needs to be diversified in order to stay more relevant in 2020 moving forward, but deer are cash cows. Pittman Robertson funds, a lot of deer hunting gear, excise tax. A state agency's lifeblood is the sale of hunting licenses and hunting permits. And guess what? On the hunting side, at least, it begins and ends with deer. Everything else is playing for a very distant second place. The trickle down effect of deer to Ohio's outdoor economy is huge. Collectively, $1 billion annually, it has been estimated. And deer are a huge part of that equation. Where does that leave us? It's hard for me to answer for each of you, but I'll take the liberty of answering for the Ohio Department of Natural Resources and most any other state agency in the Eastern United States. It leaves those state agencies in a tough spot. I dare say state agencies have a dear problem. Why? because their charge is to manage wildlife resources, not just deer, in trust of the public, which includes deer hunters, but is not restricted to that relatively small constituency group, right? And we follow that through, it has a lot of implications on the degree of emphasis placed on managing deer or managing for deer. So last week, I'm a mentor for second year students. And one of the things we talk about in the fall semester is reflecting on mentors in their life and making sure 
that they are frequently touching base with those mentors for wisdom, for perspective, for encouragement, to keep them grounded as they're tackling what is a difficult thing, university, right? Especially in the COVID era. A couple of weeks ago, I was fishing for sort of a, a pithy bit of wisdom uh, from students. And one, one student piped up and said, I've got one, I've got one I'll share. My grandma once said, you have to treat your emotions like you'll have to treat your kids one day. You can't lock them in your trunk and forget about them, but you can't let them drive the car either. Where am I going with this? Well, for a state agency, deer are a lot like kids or emotions. Pick one and run with it, all right? State agency, not in a position to forget about, disregard, or mismanage deer. That said, they certainly cannot do what HB 1483 alleges the Pennsylvania Game Commission did, which is to focus uh, a campaign of extermination on this species. False, right? Propaganda. However, if a state agency lets deer drive the car, Again, right, there's economic reasons why they may be tempted to do that. And I'm proud to say that the deer program in Ohio has done a great job of making sure deer are not in the driver's seat. They recognize their importance, but they do so with a nice pragmatic balance. If a state agency let deer drive the car, doing so flies in the face of science and allows deer to be the big problem for conservation that deer can potentially be, all right? A laser focus in benefiting deer would literally be a conservation catastrophe, all right? So <clears throat> where does this leave us? I wanna make a statement. I believe, again, preaching from within the halls of my, one of my tribes, deer hunters could be one of the strongest coalitions of potential land and habitat managers in Ohio, in the greater Midwest that this landscape has ever seen. It could be. I would argue today they're not, but they'd be right up there behind woodland owners, which we knew through surveys, own rural woodlands because of the aesthetic and opportunity and recreational value of wildlife, not just deer, but deer play heavily in that equation. Um, as a woodland owner, I, I believe that to be a characteristic of everyone tuned in today, you can help that stakeholder group be a bigger part of the solution and less of the problem. And why is that community so well positioned to be a good positive agent of conservation change. When we think about ha habitat, <coughs> sorry about that. Well, A, they care, B, they're invested, We're talking pocketbook now, uh, B, they interact, know and love the land, and D, they're just plain passionate. All right, now I've picked on deer hunters. I'm going to, you may think I'm about to pick on some other species. I'm actually going to use these next couple of examples of an excellent example of how reframing single species management can benefit a much wider, bigger, more expansive tent of wildlife species, habitat types, and conservation positive outcomes. So I've used the terminology, society has a deer problem. Conservation has a deer problem. State agencies have a deer problem. Pheasants forever could have had a pheasant problem. I was on the phone yesterday talking with someone about this talk and I said, you know, I'd be curious in a survey to know what the percentage would be for under 40 year olds in correctly identifying a pheasant or a peacock. <laughs> Simply put, the odds of an Ohio landowner 
knowing about and caring about pheasants is slim to none these days. Pheasants Forever has overcome this by reframing their organization, really from the outset, as a habitat organization. And they have been a leader in latching on to other wildlife as sort of a banner by which to lead this habitat charge. They've done wonderful things for pollinators. Sticking with the theme of pollinators, the Monarch Joint Venture two years ago, I'm on their science advisory team. Monarch Joint Venture realized Monarch Joint Venture has a monarch problem. Their most well attended and in some ways, in my opinion, most impactful webinar series has been a webinar series termed more than monarchs. So why monarchs? Well, they're intrinsically important. Conserving monarchs matters, but it's more than just their own protection. Creating habitat for monarchs is important for monarchs, but here's the way that monarch habitat and conservation helps people, helps other wildlife, helps environments, helps supply ecosystem services, right? So this is again a reframing of a single species management perspective. Now, we've discussed this in passing, deer being the ultimate generalist, right? Um, right behind like coyotes and cockroaches, deer are ultra plastic, highly adaptable species. They can carve out a living in a wide range of conditions. Um, in wildlife ecology methods, a senior level wildlife course that I've taught for the last eight years, unfortunately not teaching this fall, I love that course. Um, but, I, but I ask students, I say, what is harder to manage for? A habitat generalist or a habitat specialist? So what is harder to manage for, deer or something like rough grouse, deer or something like marsh wren, deer or something like the Carner blue butterfly? Uh, generally elicits a wide range of answers, slightly tilted towards it's harder to manage for generalists. But if we reframe that question just a little bit, what is it easier to know how to manage for? That answer is obvious habitat specialists, right? If you try to look up deer, th that is to look in the address book, 1753 Powers Boulevard and show up there, your man may not be there, right? But if rough grouse have an address, they have an address there for a reason. The habitat conditions are good. They're specialized and meet their needs. And if you show up there, rough grouse, at least 20 years ago, were likely to be there. Okay. So where are we going with this? <clears throat> well, I would posit that a tidal wave change in the way that state agencies, the way that the recreational sportsmen and women community think about deer needs to change. I am totally okay with folks managing for deer, but the gains to be made are massive if managing for deer is reframed as we're managing for young forest. We're managing for early successional conditions and mindful of the fact that we could be creating ecological traps for non-deer species. Young Forest Initiative has done a wonderful job with this, um, working with the Wildlife Management Institute, our own Ohio Bird Conservation Initiative as a formal partner to the Young Forest Project. They identified the American woodcock, the golden wing warbler, and New England cottontail as sort of moving Midwest to Pennsylvania and New York, Northeast to Maine, New Hampshire, Vermont, New England cottontail. So woodcock, golden winged warbler, New England cottontail as these umbrella species by which to push more holistically framed ecosystem based early successional habitat management. That is the right way to proceed. Will deer benefit? Of course they will in spades. But we also have to remember if we don't manage the deer they will cripple the efforts for that host of species which can collect under that umbrella. 
they're capable of ruining it. All right. Oh, geez, Louise. <clears throat> For those of you who tuned in wanting to know how to manage four deer, these next six slides are for you. Um, I did not spend much time discussing the ins and outs of managing four deer. Why? We live in the information age. There is more information about this single topic than not nearly any other topic out there. All right. Um, so I would encourage you to explore and find those resources which meet you where you are for your case specific scenario. But here are six basic principles that I'll run through um, and, and share. Number one principle, manage for cover. Now I could have said manage for water or I could have said manage for um, food or manage for space, sort of food, cover, water, space being sort of the four elemental components of habitat. Ma manage for cover, all right? Um, again, I'm a deer hunter. I moved to Ohio. I want to experience this southeastern Ohio public lands that I've heard about. My strategy was to pay close attention to time-stamped aerial imagery and follow around the most recent timber harvest operations on state-owned wildlife areas. Timber harvests create cover. Cover results in security. Add a little hunting pressure, deer flock to security, cover equals security equals venison. Timber stand improvement, wonderful way to improve cover at the horizontal, right? Me standing on the forest floor and seeing how far I can see interrupted through the woods. It creates that horizontal cover instantly and over a few years will then result in a vertical flush of cover, cover um, with a little bit more drawn out time scale. Timber stand improvement. I would love for someone to walk up to Kathy Smith next year and say, you know, as a result of that Friday in the Woods webinar, I did a timber stand improvement on my property. Um, well, you wouldn't imagine how many more songbirds nested in there. Um, we saw X and Y and Z for the first time in several years. And oh, by the way, before that webinar, I would have said we did a TSI for deer. But look at all these other things that are benefiting. That is how a reframing can go a long way to increase the relevancy of our behaviors and actions. Uh, last but not least on this note, um, edge notching or edge feathering. Marty mentioned my involvement with rights of ways. Um, this photo here was actually part of an edge notching project along some CPG gas lines in Guernsey County. Um, it's phenomenal habitat now. It essentially prioritized invasive species management in so doing brought out and treated with herbicide those invasive shrubs, cut out non-merchantable timber or tree species that did not have high bang for the soft mast, like black cherry or hard mast, like white oak, buck, and then made sure that invasive species didn't recolonize that site through time. Well, all of a sudden you've got horizontal visual obstruction just a year growing season afterwards. And right behind me from where I took that photograph is a well pad clearing where American Woodcock, the landowner was thrilled to report, the very next year had returned and were doing their annual dance, all right? Number two, <clears throat> if you prioritize your management for cover, you will also have by default managed for food. All right, um, sort of a strange graphic to have on the slide, but if you can walk under it, deer can't reach it, plain and simple. They can't. But if you create cover, Deer are so plastic and adaptable in terms of their diet, and many of the native forages in the eastern United States have moderate to high inherent crude protein levels, uh, which is another way of saying how good is the forage, 
all right? If you can walk under it, outside the possibility that out a few weeks out of the year, softer hard mouse drops to the forest floor, it is A, not cover, and B, not food. Of course, this is the oft-seen browse line. You might find hard or soft mast on the ground in there, depending on what's in the overstory. But you cannot find many native forbs. Managing for grasses as a deer element in diet is more of like a, um, the interspersed openings um, within a forested landscape. Um, but you're also subjecting what's left, which is woody browse, to intense pressure through herbivory. And because deer are not only adaptable in their diet, they're also choosy in what they eat to a point, they will select those forages with higher preferability. Unfortunately, oaks, highlight one example, are quite tasty. Manage for cover. Cover equals food. Manipulate succession. I'm only openly sharing this because the Wayne National Forest is well aware of the problem and has been very vocal in highlighting the problem and to their credit, proposing some solutions to overcome with desperate need for early successional habitat and young for younger forest stands on the Wayne National Forest, in parentheses, less than 0.1% of forests are under 10 years old. We support the clear cutting of pine, white pine stands in order to address those crucial needs. Now, those are not their words, they're mine. Um, I serve as the policy and advocacy uh, committee chair for Ohio's chapter of the backcountry hunters and anglers. And we're really interested in what happens on public lands. And currently, the Marietta Athens Pine Project is open for public input. It has sort of uh, been open, temporarily closed, open, temporarily closed, open, temporarily closed. You know how the bureaucracy and process works, but collecting public input. This was my input on behalf of Ohio BHA. Um, what I realized doing back of the envelope math is that, and, and this is not me saying, Wayne National Forest should harvest as much timber as they can sustainably. But this is me saying, at the current rate, the Wayne National Forest, their model suggests that southeastern Ohio's forests are on a, do the math, 10,000 year rotation cycle. It shouldn't be. Like I said, to their credit, they're looking at some mechanisms to make some gains in that area. So manipulate succession. Manage succession with disturbance. I almost made it through a presentation without bringing in Leopold, but I failed. Uh, Leopold's five tools of wildlife management are a great place to start. The ax, the plow, the cow, the fire, the gun. Four tools, the top four, are indirect methods of wildlife management. That is, by managing the habitat through ax, plow, cow, or fire, we will then incur change in the wildlife. So ax, plow, cow, fire, indirect tools of wildlife management. The gun sounds a lot like to me managing deer. All right, and just as an aside, and I know there's some students tuned in, um, might wanna scribble this in. Um, mechanical removal of thatch or vegetation with something like a mower or a rake is a decent surrogate for grazing. Leopold's tool, the, the, the cow. And an okay replacement for fire sometimes can be the responsible use and application of herbicides. So how can we manipulate succession with disturbance? Well, this is a decent list to start with. 
again, staying out of the weeds and the details. This again goes back to reframing managing for deer. If woodland owners are managing only for deer, there's a very good chance that in so doing, you are creating conditions that, yes, they're good for deer, but they are fundamentally bad for lots of other things. Edges are notorious for being sink habitats. And a sink habitat in its worst form might be termed an ecological trap. That is, as an organism, I see something that looks a lot like home. But when I show up and I cement in my mailbox and I try to raise some nestlings, I find out that I have moved into a very bad neighborhood. Edges, make sure that when we're thinking about edges, because we think about edges with deer, because edge, ed, uh, deer are edge loving species. They love mosaics, they love disturbance. Think about the edges that you're creating as you manipulate succession through disturbance and make sure that you're thinking more holistically. Would this benefit deer? Yes. Would it benefit other things that I know am prone to being deceived by sink habitats? No. Adapt. Don't do it. The deer don't need your help that bad. There, I said it. And again, if deer habitat managers can think more holistically, I will be the first to help them tell their story of reframing deer management as loudly and as proudly as they want to scream it off the rooftops. I sincerely hope we see a title shift in that stakeholder group. Uh, last but not least, think beyond your patch or property. Um, this is a great um, uh, sort of graphic uh, from Clint McCoy. So he's our Ohio deer biologist. He did his PhD research in South Carolina um, so these are South Carolina numbers. Um, just know that Ohio deer home ranges are probably uh, a, a little bit larger than he was finding at his study site there in South Carolina. Um, if we had a poll, I would ask, how many acres um, uh, do you control? You, you call the shots on, right? Uh, you can manipulate or you can run a fire, or you can harvest timber or, or, or whatnot. <clears throat> Chances are, if you plot yourself on this graph, um, you're going to realize that you encompass one twentieth or one tenth or a fifth or a fourth or a third or a half. I dare say there are precious few of you who, if conveniently enough, a deer home range landed perfectly centered on your property, that you would encompass all the whereabouts of that deer throughout the year. What that means is this. We talked about quality and quality. You can manipulate your landscape quantity. You can commit as a landowner to be heavy on the trigger. What you may or may not be able to do is to dictate and trickle down changes to that deer population's quality. Okay, you can do great things in terms of managing your local quantity, but you need to work together beyond property boundaries, whether through informal conversation or more formal things like cooperatives. If you want to see deer existing on a higher nutritional plane and newsflash, if they are, guess what? You've now opened the umbrella for conservation and there is a wealth of other wildlife species that are likely benefiting because you as a landowner have now properly understood the balance between managing deer and managing for deer. Now, we're gonna end with a Bible verse, all right? So take me to Sunday school. Job 1, 21. This is how I'm gonna try to get it to stick in our minds. Job. Whether you're a churchgoer or not, you likely know Job's story. Rich guy with lots of stuff. Devil asks the Lord, 
hey, would you mind if I mess with your servant Job? No. Go for it. Devil starts messing. All his cows die. His crops dry up. The house falls in on his kids. Job 121, the good landowner giveth and the good landowner taketh away. Now this is obviously a paraphrase, but a good loan landowner who wants to manage four deer has to give quality habitat, but they must also send some disinvitation notices to the buffet that you've created for the deer. Um, and to connect it with this picture, I gotta be honest, that Thanksgiving turkey looks real delicious. But if everybody at that table thinks they're going to go home satisfied and full, they got another thing coming. I hope there's about four more turkeys somewhere in the background. Uh, that is to say, go for it. Manage for deer. But only invite 60 or 70% of the deer to the dinner table. Therefore, enough crumbs fall off the table and everything else can benefit from what you've focused on for deer, okay? The good landowner giveth, the good landowner taketh away. Last slide, resources to manage for deer. Uh, must have put in the wrong images, my apologies. Oh wait, no I didn't. These are the two best resources I know of for a land manager in Ohio to manage their woodlots for wildlife and Deer. Deer will benefit from the vast, vast, vast majority of the habitat management practices outlined in these two documents. On the left, if you own a small forest patch in a relatively open landscape. On the right, if most of what you own is woods. You need to find these resources. You need to get into these resources. This is where the details come in. This is where reaching out to folks like Kathy Smith, in your local EQIP office with the NRCS. This is where reaching out to your local soil water conservation district wildlife specialist comes into play. There are lots of resources to manage for deer, but think more holistically than just deer. Whew. Believe it or not, I got through a presentation about deer without saying the word food plot. And nothing wrong with them, but just saying. Um, any questions? Uh, there pictured is actually the rump fat cap off a deer living on extraordinarily high nutritional plane. All right. Thank you, Gabe. Um, so Kathy just mentioned that both of those resources that Gabe mentioned are posted on the Ohio Woodland Stewards page under our publications tab. The link that I put uh, will take you to where they are posted under the Ohio Bird Conservation Initiatives website if you want to check out um, what that organization is, is all about. And, and Gabe, I love how, how, uh, how you mentioned those two guides. Um, they are uh, quite, quite good. Um, okay, so let's get to some questions. Uh, okay, so Kathleen asks, recommended number of deer per acre in Ohio, rural versus urban? <laughs> Oof, yeah. Um, <laughs> without pulling up the map, I believe ODNR's reference map um, is, the, the resolution is at the county level, okay? And I believe the classes are under 15 deer per square mile between 15 and 30, 30 to 45. And if it's 45 deer or more per square mile, you got major issues, okay? Um, depending on your circumstance, 15 to 25 deer per square mile is a fairly realistic place for which you can support. That said, there are places that can support a healthy deer population slightly higher. That said, if your property is fairly large and looks a lot like some of the more 
old oak hickory stands in the Wayne National Forest. Again, kind of like relating food to cover. Eight to 12 or 15 deer might be all that you can support at that highest nutritional plane and ensuring those deer do not have lasting negative impacts that you have to deal with down the road. Great question. Yeah. It depends. <laughs> Hate that answer, right? <laughs> Well, I think it makes a good point. It stresses the importance to know what your resources is. If we're talking about, you know, a woodland patch, it, it's, it, it underlines the importance of doing a forest inventory and knowing what you have out there. The other thing I'll mention there too is, is this, um, there is sort of like a preoccupation with knowing how many deer are on the landscape. Um, and I gotta be honest, there's probably nothing that a deer biologist at the state agency level can say in a meeting that will torque the audience off more than, it doesn't matter, right? And I've heard Clint say that and I've heard Tonk say that. How many, how many deer are in Ohio? It doesn't matter. What matters is if you go into your habitat and you see things like Yonimus americanus, strawberry bush, you see oak seedlings regenerating that aren't top browsed, Right? And you're not struggling to keep a garden, pushing vegetables through your front door and into your kitchen crisper. If the habitat isn't saying, warning, 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 there's too many deer, chances are you might be sort of in that ballpark. Now, I will say this, it is easier to know when you're on the really wrong end of the spectrum in terms of like, we got way too many deer then sort of there in the middle ground. But if you are getting cues from your habitat, there's a very good chance that you some time ago overshot what is sustainable. Like, like you've got some work to do to get back on top of the deer problem, okay? And just to uh, clarify for everyone, Gabe mentioned this early in the presentation, but um, Mike Tonkovich and Clint McCoy, they're both with the ODNR Division of Wildlife um, Mike Tonkovich is the deer program coordinator and then Clint McCoy is a deer biologist um, with the state agency. Clint is actually on. He said, no, nobody cares about density. Measure impacts. Look at the habitat and it will tell you if you have too many deer. Thanks, Clint. I hear an amen coming from uh, Clint's uh, home office. Excellent. All right, another question. Truth to the rumor that many deer are starving. Hey, Clint, you want to take that? <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, not to put Clint on the spot, we certainly can upgrade him to a panelist. <laughs> um, it, it, if, if, the, uh, if the person who asked the question means literally shriveling up and dying from starvation, that is not happening very many places in Ohio. Okay. Um, but all it takes, and occasionally states just north of us in latitude where winters can get really severe and we're like deer yard up. So there'll be like these uh, raised um, patches of forest in a swamp, okay? And as the snow comes and the snow comes and the snow comes and it gets deeper and deeper and deeper, deer will literally migrate to these high spots in a swamp, which typically have a conifer cover. And those conifers support some of the snow and you'll get huge aggregations of deer. In those circumstances, I think the only reason we don't see deer starving is because our like pinch point in terms of climatic severity, is it quite bad enough to do that often? In Minnesota and Michigan, UP, in a deer yard under poor habitat conditions, when a really severe winter hits, it will look like a cemetery. Okay, it's not winter that killed those deer. <laughs> it's not winter that killed those deer. It's the fact that those deer went into winter at a reduced nutritional plane because of habitat. Clint, you're on the you're on the hot seat. He doesn't like the hot seat. <laughs> See him there. <laughs> All right, uh, typically no, um, but, but certainly um, when that nutritional plane, and I live within walking distance of Sharon Woods Metro Park, 
okay, some of the highest deer densities ever recorded on planet Earth. Those deer were hanging on by a thread, starving, okay? But again, that's like worst of the worst of the worst of the worst of the worst circumstances. Um, I see Clint's got a microphone now, which I presume means he's got the ability to speak. You want to weigh in there, Clint? He should. He should. Can't hear you, bud. Yeah. Mm -mm. I'm popping him up to a co-host to see if that makes a difference, but it shouldn't. Well, pop in when you can, and if you'd like to, Clint, let's uh, move on with the questions. Um, another question about what happened with the Mohican Memorial Forest controversy? I don't know. What controversy? I might not have a long enough uh, Ohio history to know what, what's being referenced. <laughs> Kathy? Well, my, I mean, my recollection on Mohican is, of course, when we were talking about all the cutting. Yeah. Um, I don't know about anything on the deer side of things. I haven't been as connected with Mohican mm. in the last few years, but um, yeah, I mean, there was a lot of push when they were harvesting, but that's been a long time ago. Yeah. Uh, so she further said that uh, cutting the pine stands was what she was referring to. Okay. Yeah, I know there was a push to, um, you know, it's all pretty much non-native kind of where there were plantations that some of them were managed, some of them weren't, they weren't in the best of health. And so there was um, quite a bit of discussion about letting those convert um, to more native hardwood stands. Um, I haven't seen anything on that discussion like I said, probably for a few years um, to know kind of where they landed. Yeah, Kathleen is referencing the cutting pine stands. Never mind, answered. Great. <laughs> Great. Thanks. Um, for those of you that missed the beginning section, um, if you do have questions, please put them in the question and answer box in the ribbon at the bottom of your box. I do see some folks putting them in the chat and we will get to those, um, but any any future question questions, if you could put in the Q&A, um, just helps us keep track of them a little bit better. Okay. Um, okay, I feel like we just, what happened here? I have a feeling Do we the, just lost some Q&A questions. Not, um, okay. My yeah, Mark Wilfie had one, but I don't see yeah, it anymore. I know, I don't know what happened. Um, I think I replied to his actually. Okay, good. Okay, yep. good. okay. All right. So, um, if you asked a question in a Q&A and we don't um, vocally <laughs> voice it or to say it, uh, check in the um, answered box. Um, so some, sometimes we can type in answers. Okay, so Marlene asked, my, my friend lives in North Canton City in Stark County. Uh -huh. Yesterday she saw a large uh, piebald buck. How rare is this and should she report it to the Division of Wildlife? Um, Division of Wildlife would be intrigued, but they don't need to know about it. Um, what you're observing is fairly rare. Um, unfortunately for piebald deer, often you're looking at one um, expression of an interesting and unique set of genes, right? In, in, in some cases, uh, uh, piebald deer also have other abnormalities going on with them. Um, so I've actually seen a number of deer that will often have a, a more pronounced um, muzzle. Um, they'll have uh, some irregularities in, um, and this is like my anecdotes, like I've observed a small number of piebalds and in almost every case, they've had extra strange things going on with them. Uh, they've had strange like spinal vertebrae fusions going on. They've had abnormal hooves. Um, so again, coincidence or just sort of my um, anecdotes matching up with reality. Yeah, you've got a, a genetic recessive trait there that's that's expressing itself. And um, sort of like look, look up terms like uh, melanism, amelanism. Um, this is sort of like a Jeopardy trivia here. Um, but there are actually several states where it is illegal 
to harvest, to kill um, a piebald or an albino deer. And that is to prevent, um, in, in my opinion, that's a state agency's way of preventing a, a bad optic, right? Everybody recognizes the white deer on Farmer Joe's field, right? And then it shows up dead in somebody's pickup truck. That can be a problem. It's not quite Cecil the lion, but they're trying to avoid that optic. Neat question. Yeah. Okay. Um, what is healthier for deer, acorns or dried corn? Acorns. Yeah. By miles and miles and miles. Um, Kathleen actually has a question right above that. Is corn mm -hmm. bad for deer's digestion? Um, it, it, it can be. It can be. Um, as a, <clears throat> so one issue, um, I'll, I'll share two stories here. Um, in my master's and PhD research, Clint battled the same issue, okay, when he was doing his work down in, in South Carolina. Um, to get these collars on bucks, to be able to know where they're going on the landscape, you've got to get your hands on them, right? So we're sitting up in tree stands in the middle of the night with you know, military grade night vision equipment and darting deer. Well, when you get to a darted deer, there's a certain position that deer needs to be positioned in so that the rumen, again, deer are kind of like a cow, they have a rumen, they got four chambered stomach. There's a fermentation process going on in there. And if you don't position that deer in a way that they can literally expel those fermenting gases, right deer start to bloat a heavy corn diet can interfere with that fermentation process and at certain times of years can be like a legitimate issue um, in other parts of the country um, there are certain uh, forages where deer are literally starving on a full stomach um, a, a place I've been that's near and dear to my heart Kodiak Island the winter snow pushes Sitka blacktail deer down to the beaches. And when those Sitka blacktail deer cannot get to woody browse, and the only thing they have to eat up is the kelp and seaweed washed up on the beach, they starve in mass. And the unfortunate part is they have starved with a full stomach because there's no nutritional quality in that seaweed. Now, corn's not that bad but it's definitely not as good as an acorn. Great. How to effectively encourage young forests in urban county parks? Fencing is very expensive. Do you have any additional suggestions? We are actively managing deer populations with bow hunting and culling. Oh boy. Um, call John CPAC. <laughs> <laughs> Oh man, yeah, oh, that's a million dollar question. Um, fencing is expensive. Um, fencing is expensive. Uh, if you think about though how the state and national forest system has had to regenerate young forests in Pennsylvania, they're doing it with really expensive fencing. Um, they are fencing in 20 and 40 acre clear cuts and shelter woods to ensure that what regenerates is a forest one and B possesses desirable trees like black cherry, white oak and red oak and other species. Um, whew. Yeah, keep after them. Heavy, heavy culling and well-managed archery programs. Um, but it's difficult because again, you don't exist in a vacuum, right? What you're doing is also influenced by the fact that you're surrounded by probably a highly parcelized suburban or urban district where sort of always an influx of more deer. So you're never able to sort of rest on your laurels and say, "Woo, we got ahead of them for a little while, right? That's a tough one. I wish I had a more clear cut answer there, Carrie, but it is a the tough hill to climb. Yep. Uh, do hunters drive deer evolution, evolution talking, oh. by taking only big deer? 
<laughs> so. Mark with a C. That's a great question. <laughs> yeah. um, I bet you Clint would be able to answer this with more confidence. I can say this. In mountain sheep populations, so like big horn sheep, like Rocky Mountain National Park, you see the big sheep with the tractor tires attached to its head. You go to Alaska and you see the white sheep standing up on the mountain, doll sheep. Um, they've been collecting data for long enough to know um, that yes, selective pressure on those ram populations has influenced traits, which basically means they're playing, where hunters are playing a role in natural selection, what is being selected for. Um, one of the reasons it's documented in those populations is that A, they're closed, right? So it's like, there's sheep on a mountain and other sheep aren't just gonna like wander over and join that mountain. Right, so there's not much gene flux with the rest of the landscape. Um, and B, sheep populations tend to be fairly small. So there's not 900 or a million or 1.1 million deer sheep on the mountain. There's 120 or 200. So um, if you're kind of familiar with genetics terms like a founder effect and bottleneck, those traits are more likely to be influenced in those settings. I kind of like danced around actually answering the question about deer. I, I don't know, <laughs> um, but I bet you could find that out. I'm confident someone has looked at that, but can't say that with certainty. Great, great question. Hey, Gabe, we've had that question. Before. This is Clint. We've had that question before. Um, and I would have done about the same job as you did at answering it uh using <laughs> the sheep using the sheep <laughs> using the sheep example is 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 what where i would have gone with that as well uh we don't have any documented there's no documented evidence that it's happening in in these large uh white-tailed deer herds just because like you said um when you have small numbers and only you know hunters in those environments with those sheep you only have a handful of sheep that get harvested in the hunters. Typically it's a lifetime achievement to get a tag to hunt those. So you're going to obviously take each time you're taking the largest animal out of that population. Um, with deer, there's just so many that, that the same effect is unlikely to occur. Yeah. Not to mention the fact that like the statewide regulation is if it has an antler, I think in Ohio longer than, or outside of the hair, it's a buck. Therefore, it's legal. With sheep, there is literally a policy. Often that horn has to come around and come back up to the jawline, which is to imply it's a seven-eighths curl. So all the hunters are forced by law to exercise the same selection, whereas it's an individual choice with deer hunters. We're going to wait for a great big one. I'm going to shoot the first buck that walks by because boy, it's been a while since I've had a good venison steak, right? Yeah, that's a good point because here in Ohio, um, we're still, still 40% 40, 40 or so of the annual harvest uh, of bucks is going to be yearling bucks. So that's their first set of antlers. So 40% of the harvest, there's no genetic, there's really no genetic selection going on. Good question, Mark. Thanks. A uh, question from uh, Chris Zoller. How many acres does a landowner need in order to effectively manage for deer? More than you think. <laughs> <laughs> a lot. Um, <laughs> Travel. <laughs> I know Clint gives some presentations on cooperatives. Um, maybe he wants to weigh in again. A, a lot. To, to really have a measurable difference, right? Uh, you, you can do a phenomenal job of managing for deer and the deer in their behavior may respond to the habitat, right? But like responding in, hey, we're spending more time here, landowner, you've done such a good job. Woo, keep it up versus we're spending more time here and 
we're starting to locally reverse the trends of yearling antler beam diameter and some of our fawns are now having fawns themselves like you're, you're talking landscape level changes that are necessary in order to incur that sort of an effect so kind of depends on framing there but but that's not to discourage you from being an active woodland <laughs> manager because again it ain't about deer Even though uh, it should encourage it should it should be an encouragement to to spread your newfound knowledge to your neighbors and uh, yes. try to get them on board because that's that's really what it requires for effective deer management is it's no one it's no one landowner in in almost 99 percent of the cases it's it's going to be a collection yeah all right thank you uh frank asks so obviously wolves and cougars are gone is there any natural predation on deer these days? I'm glad you're on here, Clint. Um, <laughs> you give some coyote deer pop population uh, presentations. Go for it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so the short answer to the question is yes, there is still some predation that uh, with the influx of coyotes over the last two decades or so, um, they, they, they predate fawns primarily, um, a handful of adult deer will fall, but those are rare. Uh, so there is some predation pressure, but it is, it is definitely not enough to, to control population trajectories. Um, in the past, you think about the history of deer, uh, they were around in the ice age and you think about everything that lived then to control deer populations. Um, and deer still survived. You know, you're thinking saber-toothed cats, giant short-faced bears, and just the, the American lion, you know, all of these huge uh, predators that were around back then and deer still survived them. So, uh, alone, uh, you know, the, the long coyotes not, not going to be enough to, to manage the population for you. They take a few deer, sure, but um, it's very, and in today's world, uh, without hunters, you don't really have uh, population management uh, anymore. Thanks, Clint. Ron says, I want to increase the population of understory woody plants in my woods, particularly native shrubs. Is, are there any recommendations for successful establishment of them considering there is heavy deer browsing activity? Um, hold up one second. I'm trying to knock out a few of these questions through text. Uh, change the name of to available. In certain <laughs> at the All right. Other Ron, I just answered your question. Um, oh, well, you kind of ended the question was sort of the solution, at least the lowest hanging fruit. You got to reduce the browsing pressure. And that can be done two ways. It can be done by reducing the number of mouths on the landscape, but also, and I hope the quotes from the Adams County farmer and the Seneca County farmer kind of helped explain this. It's not that the Seneca County farmer is not experiencing deer damage. It's that he's experiencing deer damage in a landscape where the vast majority of the land cover is corn and soybeans, right? So the, the measurable and observed effect of that deer browsing is overwhelmed by the sheer quantity of groceries out there. So one way to reduce the felt pressure is by doing things like active forest management. So letting more light penetrate through the overstory and reach the forest floor, whether it's timber stand improvements, crop tree management, or shelter wood or clear cutting, or any other number of really good options working with a forester, all of those will result in more tonnage of woody browse where the deer can reach it. 
and at that point, right, whereas before maybe you're looking at 10 oak seedlings and nine of them are browsed, perhaps you can move that needle to where out of every 10 oak seedlings you notice, six are browsed, which implies that there's going to be some survivorship. Another really clever way, and I've, I've seen this trick used by foresters in the Allegheny National Forest. I've, I've spent a decent number of of um, a decent amount of time over there is that during a timber harvest, rather than take the slash, that is sort of like the extra brush and treetops from a harvest and, and clean it up and kind of uh, make the forest look pretty again, like really prioritize aesthetics. They'll actually drag those treetops into areas where they're more likely to get things like acorns germinating. And then those tree tops that slash actually kind of provides a, a, an organic fence that prohibits deer from easily navigating that understory. And sure enough, you can go into a downed tree top and look, and those oak seedlings are going to be intact. But everywhere else where the deer's mobility isn't impaired, you might see heavy browsing pressure. But that's another really clever way where I've seen effectively um, both the Forest Service as well as a Collins Forestry, who's a big private industrial timber company over there that have adjoining land own ownership boundaries um, that they've made some gains in that department. Thanks. Okay. Hey. Uh, Frank says, I was told by a forester that the most effective way to control deer was to have a mature forest. Comments? I love mature forest. <laughs> we all should love mature forest. <laughs> and if your property is 40 or 80 or 150 acres and it's all mature forest and that's what you like, who am I to tell you that you should cut down your mature forest? But as you step back and scale, if all we see is mature forest, and at the Wayne National Forest level, we've got a forest that's operating on a 10,000 year rotation age. We lack diversity. Diversity creates resilience and diversified resilience makes room for all the other critters in Ohio to have a nice place that they can call home to. Um, so yeah, are you gonna, attract fewer deer to a property where you've got vaulted ceiling overstory and you don't have the cover so you can walk through and not clip your head on anything. Yeah, you'll probably carry fewer deer. You'll see more deer show up in October when your oaks are raining acorns. Um, but that said, those deer are also likely to be living on a lower nutritional plane because you've got a great food source for two months out of the year. And, and that's only in the years when we get really great mask production, which this year happens to be one. Um, I'd like to chat with that forester. So on, on that note, uh, skipping ahead to a little, uh, another question that's related to mast. Um, Gary says that he spent the week hunting in Guernsey County uh, have a stand on ridge on ridge top with many mature chestnut oak, uh, oaks. Acorns were plentiful. He sat in the stand for three days in a row, observed six bucks, uh, multiple does at the same time, vying for position around a single beech tree. All three days, the deer were coming to this one tree at all times of day, and he did not observe any deer eating chestnut oak. Um, mm -hmm. So I was wondering uh, how often do beech drop mast and why was he seeing that preference uh, All right. over so I'm going to go out on a limb here. I'm going to go out <laughs> on a limb here, Gary. <clears throat> I'm going to go out on a limb and say that the deer may have been eating beech nuts. But I'm going to say that more likely, and this is one deer hunter talking to another, that when I'm walking through a forest that's dominated by maples, oaks, or hickories, and I see a beech, if that beach has root suckers that are 18 to like six or eight or 10 feet tall, 
all of a sudden you've got a place in the woods where there are foliage limbs at deer head level. And chances are, this was a recent observation, my bet is that those deer are visiting that beach because they're scraping, which is a breeding season behavior. They have orbital glands right here and they're leaving their business cards by rubbing their eyes and pawing out some dirt circles under that beach. And then they'll actually urinate over their tarsal glands, which is another endocrine gland. And again, another form of sort of like leaving that business card. Um, I have some cameras out right now. Two of the three cameras are pointed at beech trees and they're being scraped really, really hard right now. And it's a myth that only bucks visit scrapes. Does do too. Like the communication bulletin board of the woods. Not saying that that's what you're seeing, but that's perhaps what you're seeing. Okay. Sorry, just tracking the questions here. Okay. Uh, Mary says, I live in Mahoning County and we observed a deer with what we determined was bullwinkle disease. What causes this? How rare or common is it? And will it end up killing the deer? I don't know what bullwinkle disease is. Clint, I don't is that a term you're familiar with? Uh, yeah, yeah, it's, uh, it's very rare. Uh, it's when their when their face kind of their their snout kind of balloons and they just they look like bullwinkle you know from the cartoon. All right. Um, yeah. yeah. So I mean, it's basically just uh, it's an inflammation of the tissues around the nose and the upper lip, and I don't know that they've ever isolated the actual bacteria strains that cause it, and so there's really, um, from what I know, is, is that we haven't actually isolated the, the root cause for for why some deer develop this very odd appearance um we've seen these deer um with rather large racks so which indicates that that they are you know older in age um and seen them multiple times you know trail camera pictures and whatnot over the course of maybe a couple of years so as far as killing the deer, we it's we don't think that it does, um, but otherwise it's just in just a, one of those oddities and not necessarily a, um, any sort of cause of concern for for any type of population level issues. All right, thanks, Clint. Um, Going back to what we just discussed with Gary, he did uh, have a follow up. He said, "No root suckers on this mature beach. They were the deer were clearly moving nuts to uh, leaves to find the nuts. They were at the tree for 40 minutes um, and kept searching around looking um, for those beech nuts. I mean, could it just be a a case of lots of acorns wanted something different type of thing? I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. Have to." <laughs> Take me hunting, Gary. We'll figure it out Hard together. To say. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> were, were the I would were the, were the chestnuts oak uh, acorns actually on the ground? Were they actually fallen? That would, that would be my question. Yeah. If if it wasn't already answered, we'll see if uh, he chimes in with that 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 answer. Um, uh, speaking of food and acorns, uh, Frank um, states that white oak and red oak acorns are not the same. True. Uh, do deer prefer one over the other? And where do hickory fit into uh, their diet, hickory nuts? All right, so I was literally typing the answer in. Uh, I'll just read what I wrote. Whites are okay. preferred. Um, white oak acorns are produced in one year. Red oak acorns, it takes two years. Therefore, because a white oak acorn is literally on the tree, only one growing season, not two, White oak acorns have less tannins and secondary plant compounds. It's sort of like the bitter compounds that a plant might produce in order to warn something, hey, you don't want to eat me, I'm gross, right? Um, <laughs> for those reasons and perhaps a couple of others, white oak acorns are preferred. Um, but deer will readily ingest and consume red oak acorns. And there's value in having both on your property. 
right? Because a good mast year for white oaks is reflective of that spring's frost cycle. And a good year for red oak acorns is actually a function of the year before's spring frost cycle. So it's nice to have both. You've built yourself a little bit of insurance there. As far as hickory nuts, if they do eat them, it's not very often. My guess is slim to never. Uh, Mark says, as a farmer, orchardist, tree lover who also hunts deer in Champaign County, it seems that the deer hunting lobby currently has the power in the state. Why do they drop the deer limits here and in other counties? You can't plant a tree without a five foot cage. Oof. Plant? <laughs> I imagine you're going to toss that one to me. <laughs> I am throwing you under the bus. Fantastic <laughs> questions, everybody. <laughs> uh, I don't think, uh, so speaking of Champaign County specifically, um, I don't think we've made any regulation changes there probably six, seven years. Um, it's been the last time we made any changes to the, to the regulations in that particular county. Um, but as far as the overall um, process at which, which these you know, regulations are made or are, are recommended to our wildlife council, it's, re it's fairly, uh, fairly simple. Um, we use, we use uh, a series of surveys directed at uh, our two largest constituent groups, uh, which would be our producers and our deer hunters. And we take the results from those compete, what we would consider competing survey opinions and um, balance them to see whether the overall opinion in that particular county is a desire for more or less or the same number of deer. Um, in, Cham in, in Champaign County, as you would um, probably gather from the fact that that the regulations in that county haven't changed in the last seven or eight years that we're in a relatively good spot as far as the balancing the overall desires of of the constituents in that county um so that's kind of that's it in a nutshell we, we look at those survey results we determine whether you know what the overall sentiment is from the two constituent groups whether they want more fewer or about the same number of deer and then we we make rec you know, recommendations for regulations that will move populations in those directions. Um, you know, it goes without saying that the deer populations are certainly not um, uniformly distributed across those counties, but the county is, is the smallest scale with, at which we can, we can make those decisions. So, you know, locally there are going to be issues um, where you may have a problem with too many deer and hard to hard to get stuff to grow, there could be someone else in the county that that you know there's very few deer. So it it certainly is a balancing act, and it's it's a very difficult one to do uh, at small scales. Thanks, Clint. Uh, just a reminder, folks, Gabe is kind of typing in some answers to some of the questions as we go. We have about eight minutes or so left. Um, so uh, if we don't get to your question, please check it in that answered box in the Q&A uh, box. Okay, so uh, Timothy White says, um, in response to overall deer population, what factors mainly control the buck to doe ratio? One of the shooters on a DDCP, um, deer damage control permit in my county, observed recently uh, on one of his outings, 15 deer, uh, 12 were bucks, seven were nice, uh, one inch a wall hanger, or one was a wall hanger. Um, is this cyclic? Could it potentially pose any concerns as far as deer herd management? Um, yeah, so I'm gonna, all right, so he's asking about a DDCP, which is a deer depredation crop permit. Um, so Tim, I'm going to guess that this was an observation uh, during the summer or early, early, early fall months, like as in early September. Um, 
during that time of year, deer express pretty strong sexual segregation, which basically means the guys hang out together and so do the girls. Um, the bucks, which become uh, sort of uh, lone mavericks during November as they cruise the landscape and attempt to acquire breeding opportunities, during the summer, they're actually grouped up and they sort of like um, uh, work out their social differences, right? And sort of that hierarchy is established. And, and the reason that's done in the summer is evolutionarily, it doesn't really make sense to form that social hierarchy in November when everything is on the line, right? The stakes are high. There's a chance to pass on my genetics in five minutes. Like the stakes are high. Therefore, in summer, it's a low stakes proposition to kind of feel out your competition, right? You've got your antlers are in velvet, so they're not in fighting condition. And bucks have a sense of where they sit on that social um, um, uh, scale of dominance. Um, that's not to say that in the fall, bucks don't fight to the death, but rarely does that occur um, when the opponents are not equally, in order for that to occur, both the opponents need to believe in their heart of hearts they will win, okay? Otherwise, Junior's like, I remember you, Billy. Saw you in that soybean field this summer. I'm gonna walk away, right? Or vice versa, right? Um, so all that to say, my bet would be that this time of year, when that strong sexual segregation has broken down, you would observe a more normal, for lack of a better way of saying it, sex ratio between your adults in the deer herd. So that's a seasonal phenomenon. Okay, just a couple more questions. Uh, you thought you were gonna escape talking about food plots. I know, Blaine, you're killing me. <laughs> <laughs> Blaine asks, what food plots <clears throat> would you recommend for A, optimum attraction, and B, nutrition? No, I'm, I'm totally kidding, Blaine. Um, make sure there's nothing. Uh, I'm going to incriminate myself. All right, here we go. I used to teach a course called Wildlife Food Plot Establishment. All right. So I taught that at Auburn University um, during my PhD there. Um, if you want to grab my contact info and fling me an email, we can chat. Um, a couple basic principles apply. Um, annual food plots, that is, I plant it, it grows, it produces, it dies. It's a one-time investment. It's a low-risk proposition. They tend to be not that exciting in terms of like species diversity and composition, but they can achieve tremendous flush of growth. You can target that flush of growth for the summer or the winter, right? So cool and warm season forages. The other big difference is perennial food plots. So a little bit higher investment, but if done well, you don't have to come back in year two or necessarily year three and completely reestablish the stand. Often there's maintenance, which ideally will look like a little spot spraying. If you have some weeds coming in or some mowing, particularly if there's like a heavy clover component. Um, but yeah, feel free to shoot me an email. Uh, we can talk about some more specifics. Um, I poo pooed food plots, but I understand a lot of people put a lot of energy and investment into them. It turns out I've taught a course on them too. So happy to chat. Okay, Kevin asks, what does it mean when you have a lot of does on your property, but no older bucks? <laughs> oh man. <laughs> you must live in the nursery. <laughs> um, that's a good question. Um, it's hard to know what that means. Um, simply by artifact of the landscape, if we acknowledge that the landscape is not uniform, which no one on here would agree to that, then it must mean that the landscape has variation. Um, and what that means is right, there's like a bell curve. And 
normal would be at the peak of the bell curve and like, oh, you got a few more does than normal. You got a few more bucks than you would expect. But a bell curve also has extreme tails of the distribution. You may simply live in an outlier, okay? Uh, chances are you wouldn't have to go far to find those order bucks. But the other thing is this, uh, you may live in a county and in a township where sort of the cultural deer hunting tradition has been first legal buck joins me at the dinner table. And that's a perfectly okay thing to do. Um, so you might live in sort of a micro landscape where all of the harvest pressure exerted by your neighbors um, is that the very first buck that comes by gets shot, which means you're not going to have those older age classes present in any sort of appreciable density. It's a good question. Mm -hmm. And our last question. Frank's talking about two different types of woods in Ohio, those that are never cleared, so are, are mature forests, and those that are from old fields, early successional or young forests. Um, there's a distinct difference in forest and undergrowth. Do deer have a preference for one over the other? I don't know that there's a formal study that would parse a difference in preference, um, but we can think about what the characteristics of those two types of woodlots are based on the regenerative legacy, right? Um, you walk into a naturally regenerated old pasture or old ag field. Um, some of my accountabilities are to the OSU Mansfield campus. That campus is full of 10 and 20 and 40 acre fields where you can still walk in the woods and see those straight lines of trees, like those hedgerows. Um, and you've got, we're not to a climax forest species assemblage there yet. Somewhere transitioning to that. Um, but what you don't see a lot of is double and triple and multiple stem trunks. Because again, it was a seed landed and a sprout grew. Now, I can go to other parts of that forest and see multiple trunks and know, huh, for whatever reason, this site probably was forest, it was harvested, and a lot of the trees I see today are actually stump re-sprouts from that initial clearing. Um, so what that means in terms of species composition, oftentimes in those, yeah, it was logged, those tend to be a bit older. We tend to see heavier components of hard mass bearing trees like oaks and hickories, and in those younger pasture reclaim settings, you tend to see more of your pioneer species. So you tend to see things more like, um, uh, you, you'll, you'll see some sweet gum, you'll see lots of maples, and you might see some beech. Um, you might see, um, oh, what, what are some of the other species you might see? Uh, da, 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 da. Kathy, help me out here. <laughs> maples? Yep, Hickories? mention maples. Yep. Yellow poplar. Um, so, so, cherry. Yep, black cherry. Yeah, um I'm not I'm not sure that deer would have a strong preference. I mean, in I I will say this. So. In either of those circumstances, the canopy has long since closed. And in order for you to create cover, which is the stair step to creating food, you have got to open up the forest canopy. No if, ands, or buts about it. Um, and that reply pertains to both settings. Um, I, I'd leave it at that. Great. Well, thank you, Gabe. Um, everyone, thank you so much for tuning in, for sticking around for all these questions. I hope we got to all of your questions. If not, please feel free to reach out to me and I will make sure to, to touch base with Gabe to get your questions Morning. answered. Um, we do Morning. have- stop, stop recording so I can give them the Yep, codes. I'm getting there. Yep, I was gonna say we have the continuing education credits, so I'm gonna stop recording. Kathy's gonna put that link in the box.